that in a tribulation, Christ returns to the earth. He sets up his millennial reign for a thousand years. And I don't think we completely have it all figured out. No. I, I don't, I, you know, I don't think you could have a big enough chart on your wall with no. everything to no. have it all figured out. Welcome you once again to the Uncensored Pilgrims Podcast. I'm Marty McLean, along with the Mr. Irrepressible Paul Price. Paul Price. We didn't even get a D in there today. Not Paul, today, no. Paul, you've never made a D in your life except <laughs> in your name, right? I made a D in uh, advanced, or not advanced, but it was advanced placement, which was college level chemistry. So AP chemistry, you made a... I made a D because I really hated chemistry, especially yeah. that advanced chemistry. Yes. I could not stand it. I hated it. Yeah, chemistry was not my favorite subject either. Like I've... memorizing all of those like atomic <laughs> isotope numbers and just all the stuff you had to memorize for it. Yes. It just killed me. I couldn't stand it. Yes. I, I guess at that age especially, I guess I just did not have the discipline to, to want to memorize all that stuff and i had it in my mind that i was not going to become a chemist you weren't going to blow the world up no and so uh although i think we'll be talking about that later but we're, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a little bit bit of uh but for some time reason, stuff i had it in my mind when i was in high school that i did not want to deal with chemistry and so i felt like i just did not need to uh to do it yeah you know it's I barely i barely passed <clears throat> As far as chemistry goes, uh, when I was in high school and I had chemistry, we would always get in a group with this really smart guy named Jay. Yeah. And Jay liked doing all the chemistry experiments, so we'd let Jay do them. And we'd <laughs> goof off and write the numbers down, you know, fill out the charts, whatever. So I went off to uh, the University of Georgia, and I had, uh, they, had they made me take uh, chemistry for majors because I was a biology major at the time. It was shortly, but I had to be in this. Ooh. Yeah. Chemistry for majors that must class. That have been pretty rough then. Yeah, and, and when I went to the, you know, for chemistry lab, um, I was looking, you know, see who my partner was going to be, and they, they gave me a book, and uh, they said, this is your experiment. You've got, you know, an hour and a half to do it. I didn't have a partner. You had to do it yourself. Mm. I didn't even know what any of the <laughs> instruments were. I had to look in the book and see all these instruments, see a picture of the instrument to figure out what the instrument was, because all that time during high school, I, you know, relied upon Jay. Uh, and yeah, and the, Jay wasn't with me at that time. Well, that's what happens, I guess. I mean, and the thing <clears throat> is... I remember as a little kid, I had been gifted one of those Sears chemistry sets for oh, yeah. kids. Oh, yeah. And I had a lot of fun playing with the chemicals and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, that, that part of chemistry is fun. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just don't like memorizing the whole chart and yeah, doing Yeah, when the you can mix stuff and make it blow up. I the mean... extremely complex math of, of uh, you know, this this ion moves from this what do they call energy level? You know, how, how far away it is from the center of the, the nucleus. They call yes. it, I think they call it energy levels or something. You got me, man. And it'll move from one to another and like just such complicated stuff to, to memorize. I just, I didn't, yeah, didn't go for it. And you're didn't talking about moles and don't even have a dermatologist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's incredible what you deal with in the chemistry classes. Yeah. But today we're going to ta uh, tackle the subject of the millennial reign the millennial reign, and we're not talking about R A I N. No, we're talking about R E I G N. A little bit of a spelling there for our yeah. spelling bee, a yes. fiction and autos. I didn't ever have trouble with spelling. Really? Yeah, that was that what that one I could do. So. Yeah, I I, I could spell okay. I just cannot uh, pronounce words as well as I should. I think you know when I when I was in the first grade, I had a concussion. Uh, that I got in school from being knocked into the women, the girls' bathroom door. It was just the door. I, it just it was. You I needed was you line. needed Pedro's protection. I needed Pedro's <laughs> protection, and Pedro was not there. And um, also, I broke my arm. My babysitter broke my arm playing football uh. in the house. And, and so I think I missed some days when we were pronouncing words when I was in first grade. And I <clears> think yeah. it has followed me. 
Oh, to well, this very day. Tough. All right, that's tough. It's been a tough life, man. It is tough. But we are going to talk about the millennial reign. What exactly is the millennial reign? When we say millennial, uh, Paul, how long is that? Well, that depends on who you ask. I'm it? asking you. So I say it's a thousand years. A thousand, One thousand years. years. That is why they... That is, in fact, why it's called a millennium. That's what the word means, 1,000 years. Well, let's just take it at face value. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're going to talk about 1,000 a, a years. Now, Paul, when does this millennial reign occur? Also, depends who you ask. Okay. But uh, we, uh, you and I both agree that we are futurists, which right. means we believe that the end times are yet to come. They are not Correct. fulfilled in the past like the... The opposite of a futurist is a preterist. Right. Uh, and we would disagree with them. So I say the millennial reign is future, and I also don't happen to think it's all that far off. But but uh, I don't know how, how long we got to wait, but uh, the way things are going, it doesn't seem like we're going to have to wait too terribly much longer. Yes. We'll see. I think, uh, personally, I'm what you would call a pre-trib. I believe that... Uh, Rapture of the church happens prior to the tribulation. You have the seven years of tribulation, and mm -hmm. then that will usher in <clears throat> the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years on this earth. Now, so that would be, I would be termed a pre-millennialist mm -hmm. because I, I believe that the return of Christ happens prior to the millennial reign. Yeah, but you, but but I'll have to say that that means you really think that Christ is coming back two more times. Well, you, not one more time. He's coming one time in the air to call his church uh -huh. for the rapture. And then he's coming a third time to come back down and institute the millennial reign. That would be at his, uh, that at his return. That's when he would institute his millennial his reign. His third return. How I mean, his that, second return. That would be his second. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I you think there's two returns yet I to come? I, I think there's only one I think return there's yet. the rapture where he'll... We're called up to meet him in the air. Yes. And then I think when he comes back, he's coming to the earth. But that's that's uh, after. After the tribulation. So that's like, what, uh, seven or three and a half years after we meet him in the air? Seven. Seven. See, I, I don't I don't believe the church will go through the tribulation. So there's a, there's a, group, there's a group of people that call themselves pre-wrath rapturists. And I'm not exactly sure how they're different from mid-tribulational rapturists, mm -hmm. but I think they're pretty close. They just don't say it's going to be at three and a half years or something? Or I'm, I think they, kind of I think they the kind of fudge bit? on that. I think they're not sure about the timing, but it's somewhere in the middle. But once it gets really, 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 really bad, then the Lord's going to call them up. Well, the way they view it is that the first part of the tribulation is Satan's wrath being poured out on the church. And then the second part of the tribulation is God's wrath, is being, God's poured wrath being poured out on the earth. Right. And so they think that the church will be raptured up to avoid God's wrath, but they're not going to avoid Satan's wrath. Okay. That's what the pre-wrath or mid-trib people believe. Okay. And if, if I was going to agree with any of these groups, I would probably lean to that side of the pre-wrath or mid-trib. Okay. But I kind of take the path of least resistance and say... You know, why not just say it's all the same event? So when did Mr. Irresistible, uh, Irrepressible, <laughs> I was going to say Irresistible, <laughs> when did Mr. Irrepressible ever take the path well, of least resistance? I, I think what I mean to say is I'm using Occam's razor, which is the simplest explanation is likely the correct one. And I'm just saying, why not just say that the all of these events that the Bible talks about are fulfilled at the same moment? Okay. So that would mean the view that I'm holding is called post-tribulational, which means the tribulation is over. Jesus is coming back only one more time. So the second coming is the final coming. See, you, people, and then so you like to say that okay, people to believe in the rapture and then the return of Christ. That you you like to say oh, there's that's two comings of Christ. Yeah, but you just agreed that's what it was. Wait, well, meets we meet him in the air. I understand why yeah. you would say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm saying we meet him in the air at the right. at the second coming, which is at, at no, the it, end of all the end of history, the end and the beginning of the millennial reign. So, so you're so. saying you, you're you're saying that meeting him in the air in the return of Christ will be one episode. One episode at, at the end of seven years. At the end of 
and I'm not even 100% sure if it's seven years, but we'll go with that. See, I would go with the Dollar Shave Club razor. Okay. And, and I would take... <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Thank you. We, I, I, the Dollar Shave Club yeah, razor. Yeah, not the Alcom's razor. Not I'm the Alcom's razor. I'm going with the Dollar Shave Club razor, and I'm saying that it, it, it'll happen at the beginning of the tribulation, and that in a tribulation, Christ returns to the earth, he sets up his millennial reign... For a thousand years. Yeah, so I'm saying we meet him in the air, and then we're coming with him down in a procession of victory. As he's as he, so why is so he we're going to we're going to do the big loop. We're going to meet him in, meet air, in the air, and we're going to do the big, big U-turn, loop, U-turn, U-turn, make the loop, come back down with him in victory. Down, it's like a victory march, like like a parade, like a divided highway, and you got to get in that turn lane exactly, and, and come right back, come back down around and okay. institute the millennial reign with him. Okay. That's my view, but I, I could be wrong on that. But you are pre-meal. Definitely, yeah. You're not post-meal. Whether, whether or not we're raptured at the beginning, the middle, or the end of the tribulation, the point is uh, the millennium will happen after that, yeah. and it's, it's a literal thousand years. See, me rain. and my wife, we don't even agree on the trib. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I tell her, I, I tell her I'll be watching her for about three and a half years. Is she a mid-trib then? She wants to, she wants to be mid-trib, doesn't want to really be... Uh, post trib. I would like for her to be pre trib, but she's. I'd be interested to know what kind of these these types of arguments were probably happening in the Jews before the first coming too. Yeah, you know, and I've often said, and in fact, they thought there were two messiahs coming: Messiah ben David or David, and Messiah ben Joseph. Huh. And one of them is a suffering messiah, and that's uh. But Messiah ben Joseph because Joseph he suffered. suffered. Yeah. And then the conquering Messiah is ben Messiah David. ben David. Okay. And so they, they didn't know it was the same one. But they didn't know it was the same one. Yeah. So they were having these types of arguments back then as well. Wow. Uh, and and Jews to this day still have that belief. Yeah. One thing. And so some of them are willing to say Jesus. Some Jews are willing to say Jesus might have been Messiah ben Joseph. But he wasn't Messiah ben David. That Messiah so is they yet would still to come. be looking for. They're a, still looking a for a conquering one other than exactly. Yeah. yeah, some of them. Yeah, not I, all of them agree with that. I, but that. I'm of the opinion that a lot with a lot of this stuff, just like with the first coming of Christ, even the most devout, uh, sincerest Jews could not figure out everything about the first. They didn't have it all figured out. And I don't think we completely have it all figured out. I I don't, you know, I don't think you could have a big enough chart on your wall with everything to have it all figured out, but we're going to give it, uh, we're going to give it the old college try. We'll give it the UGA try. And hopefully we went to the right college. Hopefully. And I think we did go to the right college. Well, we went, we went to, uh, go dogs, baby. Go dogs. There you go. Okay. But so, we both agree the millennial reign is a thousand years. A thousand years. And and I don't think we'll have enough time to, to fully like go into why why is it that certain groups like certain reformed Calvinist groups would argue for an ah millennial, which is they, they take the millennium as, as totally uh, figurative right. and not literal. And I've never quite understood the post millennial, but they're they're another can of worms altogether because they're like saying that that the millennium happened, but it's over with, or yeah, something like he, that. What the beginning of the uh, of the church in the first few centuries of the church, they were they were pre millennialist. Exactly, and that's why uh, a lot of people refer to this view as historic pre millennialism to to draw attention to the fact that. That was the earliest view in the early church. Yeah, let me read something to you once again from uh, Millard Erickson's book of Theology. Yeah. He says, The first three centuries of the church were probably dominated by what we would call today premillennialism. I'm going to have a hard time yeah. with that. I just, yeah. no, I'm going to say pre mill okay? Okay. All right. But in the fourth century, an African Donatist named Tychonius propounded a competitive view. Although... Augustine was an archiponent, arch, archiponent of the Dontonist. He adopted Tychonius' view of the millennium. The interpretation yep. was to dominate eschatological thinking throughout the Middle Ages. Augustine taught that the millennium does not lie in the future, but has already begun. We are in the millennium. 
Yes, and 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 Augustine would use that belief to justify the Catholic Church going out and converting people by the sword. Okay. Because he interpreted it as the sword of Jesus's mouth. Yeah. Devouring the enemies. He interpreted that in terms of So conversion of, by the sword. Conversion by the sword by the Catholic Church. Oh. So okay. that's how he interpreted it. So All right. I I mean, I'm I'm not going to throw Augustine under the bus for everything. Now, let me just say, sometimes when I'm saying Augustine, sometimes I say Augustine, sometimes I say Augustine, just like yeah. sometimes you yeah. say tomato and sometimes <laughs> you say tomato. Uh, or yeah. Caribbean and Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. Which one is it, Augustine or Augustine? That's uh, I've never actually looked into it. That's a good question. I hear both. He was, uh, he was uh, from Hippo, yes. Augustine of Hippo. And where is Hippo? Yeah, North in Africa. Northern Africa, so part of the Roman Empire. Yeah. But but probably spoke Greek, right? You would think? Uh probably or, did. I don't know. Definitely spoke Latin. Uh so yes. anyway, that'd be an interesting word study, but but in the English language we generally say either Augustine or Augustine. I prefer Augustine. But you know, I'm not going to throw him under the bus for everything, but I think a lot of the the controversies in, Even with in theology. Genesis six. Yeah, a lot of the controversies that we have today in the Christian Church over theology go back to Augustine as the originator of the disagreement. I mean, he's the first guy, I believe, that introduced what we call Calvinism today. Yeah, Martin Luther, of course, was an Augustinian yes. monk. Yeah. And he and he introduced so many different things that 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 I don't agree with. So that's unfortunate. But um, but he was he he did a lot of great things. And but we can also apparently, according to Erickson, we can also trace all millennialism back to Augustine as well. As long as we're talking about the uh, millennial reign, I'm going to read the passage in Revelation 20. It's just six verses that speak of the millennial reign. Uh, this is John speaking. He says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottom of his pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of that dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottom of his pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Yes. So that's, you know, that's after the tribulation. Uh, Christ has returned. The devil's going to be bound in the pot, bottomless pit uh, for a thousand years. Now, previously in the book of Revelation, the devil uh, had been given an, uh, a key uh, to open up the bottomless pit and let all the the demonic beings and uh the fallen angels would you consider this pit to be tartarus tartarus yes. we talked about it last yes. week but tartarus yes so you think tartarus is where satan is going to be bound uh, during uh, yes. the millennial reign yes uh, i would have yes okay. it's the bottomless pit makes sense to me yeah and and he's going to be bound during the millennial reign now the thing with the millennial reign as far as after St. Augustine, when when he said that, you know, it's now, it's a spiritual thing, it's happening now, uh, there were those throughout the this history of the church uh, who have been post-millennialist, uh, such as the Puritans. Mm -hmm. And that helps to understand some of the social changes and some of the societal reforms that the Puritans had, because if you're post-millennialist, -millennial, you believe that the gospel will eventually overtake the earth, that things will get better and better, and eventually, uh, by virtue of the gospel spreading and Christianizing the whole world, it will usher in the return of Christ. <laughs> yeah. Now, even in the 1800s in America, there were there were a lot of post-millennialist 
Uh, and even in the 1850s, it was really going strong. Yeah. You had the Second Great Awakening. There's a lot of social reforms in the United States because of the Second Great Awakening. It, society was being transformed. The gospel was really taking root. And society uh, was being, uh, for lack of a better word, sanctified, uh, was being changed. And, and then you had that thing that happened in the 1860s. Oh, yeah. Civil yeah, War. I recall that. Yeah. yeah, you had a civil war, the huge carnage. I mean, you think about Gettysburg. Uh, you think about the Battle of the Wilderness where a lot of the soldiers burned to death that were, you know, laying wounded in amongst all the timbers. And I mean, it's just a brutal, brutal experience our nation went through. And, and uh, the cause, you know, it, it just made people realize, you know, maybe we're just not getting as good as we think we are. Yeah, and, and I think that that same uh, exact thing happened again in the next century, in the, the 20th early, century. In the early 1900s, especially coming out of Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it happened with Kaiser Wilhelm and then, you know, the, with Hitler, a lot of German theologians. Uh, but that was associated with the social gospel. Uh, they seems, actually believed that the goodness of man was going to usher in the kingdom of it God. It seems like when things are going good on this earth, yeah, we get real confident in our own abilities, don't we? Well, you'll read <laughs> some of yeah some of the theology books. They'll talk about when times are really good and the gospel's really spreading and, and we're having a big impact. You you may have more post millennialist yeah. because people think, man, uh, the gospel is going to overtake the world. Yeah, uh, we're going to Christianize the world and 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 that's going to usher in the return of Christ. And, you know, in World War One, you had the trench warfare. You had that mustard gas stuff. Yep. You had the machine guns and, and the sunny liberalism. I mean, it just took a nosedive. Yeah. And so you had a, a transitioning of those from post-millennialism, uh, believing that, that the millennial reign happened prior to the return of Christ. They became, a lot of them became amillennialist. Yeah, that, it, that it's all just spiritual. It's just all spiritual. Yeah. But you still have the people who are premillennialist uh, that said, you know, hey, Jesus said before he returns that it's going to be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, like it's going to be like Noah. A, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Yeah. And if you look at that, it's like, okay, this is a pretty bad situation. That looks more more like the reality we see, though. Yeah, it? and you read in the epistles how uh, men will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, and here's another aspect that you got to keep in mind is that people who try to claim that the millennium has already passed... <clears throat> um, or that it's just all spiritual, they wind up denying some of the very clear prophecies that we get even in the Old Testament about this time. Yeah, about the lion and the lamb. Like, about, for example, about the child yeah, not dying. Isaiah 2, it says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. By the way, that's the mountain of Yahweh. It kind of irritates me uh, when our Bibles hide that, you know, that the tetragrammaton is Yahweh. So it doesn't say the mountain of the Lord. It says the mountain of Yahweh. Okay. That he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Mm -hmm. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Yeah. So that is a description clearly of this Sabbath rest of history, the the, the time when the when. Jesus is reigning on this earth. He will literally be here in he person. He will decide disputes among nations. He will he will reign as what many believe, you know, the premillennialists believe that uh, he will literally reign here on earth. And we will reign with him. That's the promise yes, that we're given. It'll be a thousand years of of world peace, of course. You know, the nearest thing people have had so far is Pax Romana, which would have been the peace of the sword during the Roman Empire. Uh, but this is going to be legitimate, real peace. It's going to be a time uh, where... We've uh, been kind of enjoying a, a type of, Amer uh, I don't know what the word is, Pax Americana. Yeah. Uh, we've been enjoying that up until maybe... Um, 2020? 2022, okay. or whenever uh, Putin invaded the Ukraine and, and broke people out of their illusion that, that real war is no longer possible. That's what they thought. Yeah. That there right. was a When I was studying international affairs, there was a, an article that we had to read, uh, The End of History. 
uh, I think it was Francis Fukuyama, but I, I can't remember okay. now. I think that's who it was. But basically this idea that globalism had put an end to war. Well, you know, John Nesbitt, who wrote Megatrends uh -huh. back in the what, early 1970s or sometime like that. I have that book. Yeah, he actually... Or I may have had it and then... I might have thrown it away because it was so boring. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I remember when I. Well, I actually, had that book. Though. Actually, I actually liked the book. It was. I thought it was pretty interesting. Well, at the um, time, it might have been. Reading it now, it's kind of like, well, I don't know. But, but I, I actually had that book. He for, said one of the trends was that we were to the the na the nations of the world would have their economies so intertwined that they would not go to war with one another because if you bomb one, it's going to devastate exactly. your, your that, economy. And so in the 80s and 90s, when things were good, that's what everybody thought. Yeah, they, they thought, they, man, they really, war, war is a well, thing of the after the, fall, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but here's what's going to happen during the millennial reign. Um, there's going to be a, a Isaiah 65, 20 says, Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or a or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at 100 will be thought of as a mere child. So it's going to be a time of longevity. Uh, it's going to be a time where uh, it says in Isaiah 11, 6, the wolf and the lamb will live together and the leopard will lie down with the baby goat. Yeah, and I'm just, I, I think we need to really take stock of how the amillennialists just want to throw all of this out of the Bible. So, so They just want to say, well, these aren't real promises. These are just spiritual promises, yeah, there are, whatever there are, that means. There are a lot of verses that you have to do a lot of crazy things with in order yeah. for, the, you know, say, well, that's not going to happen. That was just spiritualizing it. But I believe there, God's powerful enough to really make what he said happen, happen. Yeah. The, just like when he said. There's going to be a time of reign. But here's the deal, though. When you, get, when you get to the time, who's going to be here on the millennial reign? Uh, there are some people that believe there will be those with glorified bodies and there will be some with earthly, natural Well, I, I, will, I wanted to get to that because that's an interesting thing to talk yeah. about. But so, I was just going to say, you know, if you look at everything God has done, all of his promises, when he said he would disperse the Jews, mm -hmm. he dispersed them. He did and then brought them and back. And then when he said he would bring them back, he brought them back. Yeah. It literally happened. That doesn't, that doesn't <laughs> naturally happen. You never have a people group who maintain their cultural identity uh, for 1900 you years. You know why they did it? Because they're so stiff-necked. They're very, yeah. I, <laughs> That's well, what the Bible calls them. Yeah, it's like a uh, fiddler on the roof. The yeah, Ukrainian I haven't seen Jews, that one. A man, you know, uh, he said, without our traditions, we're as stable as a fiddler on the roof. Oh, okay. I need to watch that. Uh, it's, it's really a wonderful musical. And, you know, it gives you a heart for the Jewish people. And, man, they need to receive Christ. And, yes. You know, but just seeing how... You know, they were persecuted in the Ukraine uh, by the Russians and mm -hmm. all that, what, the, the pogroms, uh, all yeah. that kind of stuff. But but anyway, um, you're going to have, during the millennial reign, you're, you're going to have those with glorified bodies, those with natural earthly bodies. You're going. Uh, some people believe that the, the church will be there uh, uh, with resurrected or changed bodies. I feel like you can't escape that. I feel like that is an, an absolute clear teaching of Scripture that you cannot get around. Tribulation martyrs resurrected after Christ returns to the earth. Old Testament saints, uh, those with natural bodies uh, will be those who survive the tribulation. There's going to be two groups of those, the believing Jews and the believing Gentiles. Um, I mean, you know, it's... Now, now wait a minute. There will be children born during the... There will be children born during the millennial reign. So too. I'm going to give you my view, and you tell me where you stand on okay. it. Okay. So my my reading of scripture is that at the second coming, everyone who is a believer, both all throughout history mm -hmm. and even at the present moment, mm -hmm. every believer at that second coming, right. and I mean for you it would be the third coming, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, this is this is why. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, at that either the second or third coming, it's irrepressible. Wh whichever it is, the time when he when he is coming to defeat his enemies and institute the millennial reign, that coming. Yes. At that time, everyone who was ever a believer in the history of the earth, mm -hmm. and everyone who's alive that is a believer at that time, mm -hmm. they will all be caught up together. They will all be changed. They will all be given glorified, eternal, immortal bodies. Okay. Their 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 sin nature will be removed, and we will reign with Christ. Now that means who are we reigning over? Well, you you can't you can't think that when Jesus comes, he's going to kill literally everyone on the earth. 
Right. Because then there there would be no one there will left be those to reign. Make, over. There will be those that make it through the tribulation. So the people who make it through the tribulation, yeah. especially children, I'm sure, and, and any adults that just don't die for whatever reason at that time, those are going to be the peoples who will populate the rest of the earth, and those are the people over whom the resurrected saints will reign. Yeah. So I, I compare it. The closest thing I feel like you can compare it to mm-hmm. is uh, the Lord of the Rings. You have Middle Earth. You have race a race called the men, and then you have the race called the elves. And the elves are immortal, yeah. and the men are mortal. Okay. And and that's not a perfect analogy, but it's it's kind of maybe a, a decent analogy of what the Bible seems to be teaching about the millennial reign, that you will have immortal people, the, the resurrected saints, living alongside mortal people mm-hmm. who can either be saved or not saved. It's mm-hmm. uh, they, they may or may not get saved. Because there will be, a, at the end of a thousand years, the devil will be released from the bottomless pit and he will be allowed... It, he will be allowed to deceive gets, the nations. To deceive the nations once again, and then there will be the final and judgment. The saints cannot be the resurrected saints cannot be deceived. Let, let, let me read this to you. This is what David Jeremiah, you familiar with Yeah, David I'm familiar Jeremiah, with him. The yeah. pastor. Yeah. Now here's what he says, quote, Some people find it surprising to think of rebellion during the millennium, but here is how it will happen. Everybody who goes into the millennium will be righteous. They will be all they will all be saved. But during that 1,000-year period, there will be marriages, children will be born, and some of these children will rebel uh, against the things of God. Just like today, each person born during the millennial age will make a personal decision for or against Christ. We can be assured of this. Rebellion won't last long. The one who is in charge will know the intent of every heart, and there will be swift justice for every wrong. The Bible says our Lord will rule with a rod of iron. That means there won't be any long delays in justice, no long waits for trials, no long waits for sentences to be carried out. There will be immediate justice based upon the holy reign of King Jesus. Unquote. Yes. I agree Um, with that. I agree with that. So you've got you've got a situation where you're going to have It's hard to imagine. You know, Jesus is physically present on the earth. People can see him, they can travel to Jerusalem, meet him. Right. They may not even have to travel to meet him. He might just, you know, be able to manifest. Who knows what yeah. he's going to be doing? But, yeah. but the point is, they can they can meet him, they can see him, and yet, those same people that can that can meet and see Jesus, some of them will rebel. That's that's a scary thought. But you know, think about Judas. He yeah. he with he was with Jesus for his whole ministry, walking with him, meeting with him directly, and he still. That's betrayed right. him. That's right. That, you know, that's why some people say, hey, how can anybody rebel if Jesus is actually ruling and reigning? Well, Judas. Judas did it. He did if, it. if he can do it. And what about Satan himself? Yeah. He was in the throne room of God, right? Yes. And he rebelled. That's so true. don't say that it can't happen. It can definitely happen. That you're, as long <laughs> as there's free will. Yeah. Yeah. As long as there's free will. So, um, so there's going to be a thousand year reign. Um, and you I couldn't help but to think about all these billionaires nowadays that are in the quest for long life. Yeah. Even eternal life. Yeah. They do some really, uh, I think, I want to say bizarre things. Uh, you know, something just occurred to me that I put two and two together from something you talked about Wednesday night, talking about the... Revelation stuff and, and talking about this strange technology or whatever it is that causes people to not be able to die even though they want to. Yeah. That's an interesting thought. Does that have something to do with these weird experiments that these billionaires are trying to do to stop death? Yeah. Here's I don't a, know. Here's an article from, it's called The Week uh, publication, The Billionaire-Led Quest for Immortality. Uh, here's what it says, quote, big names include Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, Google founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin, PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel, and Oracle's Larry Ellison. Brian Johnston, an entrepreneur and venture capitalist worth millions, has also made waves for his rather shocking anti-aging efforts, which include temporary blood plasma donations from his teenage son, and um, I won't tell you what kind of but he, he also mm. uh, received some type of uh, shockwave therapy, and I'll just leave it at that, okay? Mm. Um, 
It says, Johnston, Johnson has meanwhile launched Blueprint, a flashy wellness experiment intended to explore, quote, the future of being human, according to its website. For the, that venture, Johnson takes more than 100 supplements a day, submits himself to constant medical assessments, uh, keeps to a strict diet that prohibits any food after 11 a.m. Whoa. And goes to bed at 8.30 p.m. He has even built an algorithm that takes better care of me than I take care of myself. It has extended my abilities. My mind observes. My mind no longer decides. What? So, you know, my mind no longer decides. I, I, I reckon he's trying to mesh into some type mean? of transhumanist type, you know. That sounds bizarre. That sounds demonic. Well, you know, and, and what I found out, there's this lady. Uh, her name is Megan O'Giblin. Uh, she writes in The Guardian, the UK publication. Uh, she has an article called God in the Machine, My Strange Journey into Transhumanism. Yeah. It says, after losing her faith, the former evangelical Christian felt adrift in the world. She then found solace in a radical technological philosophy. But its promises of immortality and spiritual transcendence soon seemed unsetting, unsettingly familiar. So here's something I took away from this article. I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs here. And I, I want to get your feedback on it. Now, here's what she writes. What makes the transhumanist movement so seductive is that it promises to restore through science the transcendent hopes that science itself has obliterated. Yeah. Transhumanists do not believe in the existence of a soul, but they are not strict materialists either. Kurzweil claims he is a patternist. Yeah. Characterizing consciousness as the result of biological processes, a quote, a pattern of matter and energy that persists over time, unquote. These patterns, which contain what we tend to think of as our identity, are currently running on physical hardware, the body, that will one day give out. But they can, at least in theory, be transferred onto supercomputers, robotic surrogates, or human clones. A pattern transhumanist would insist is not the same as a soul, but it's not difficult to see how it satisfies the same longing. At the very least, a pattern suggests that there is some essential core of our being that will survive and perhaps transcend the inevitable degradation of flesh. Of course, Mind uploading has spurred all kinds of philosophical anxieties. If the pattern of your consciousness is transferred onto a computer, is the pattern you or a simulation of your mind? One camp of transhumanists have argued that true resurrection can happen only if it is bodily resurrection. They tend to favor cryonics and bionics, which promise to resurrect the entire body or else supplement the living form with technology. So that's demolition man, basically. To, to indefinitely extend your life. Yeah. Yeah, that's demolition. Is that demolition man? Yeah, yeah. So you, you don't have a soul, but you have patterns. Well, I disagree with them. I'm, I'm, I am hope so, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm what you call a substance dualist, okay. and that's what the Bible teaches. Okay. Uh, unless you ask a, a Seventh-day Adventist or a Jehovah's Witness, and then they think, a weird thing called soul sleep. But uh, what the Bible teaches is uh, substance dualism, which is the philosophical f term for the belief in the supernatural soul. Okay. And so we have, uh, you know, we have a body, we have a soul, and we are a spirit and, or something like that. And so what they're, thinking, what they're trying to do is they want to extract, they wouldn't call it the soul, they'd call it a pattern. Yeah, but... Into extract, but we'd say it's soul. They want to extract your soul out of that body and put it into another entity. Yeah, the problem with that is that that our consciousness is not a pattern. If it were a pattern, of course, yeah. If it were a pattern, then number one, we wouldn't have free will. We would be limited to the pattern, right? Okay. Uh, but secondly, you know, a, a pattern. That's just like you know, if you. It's like if you were to record the frequency of your brain waves. Do you think that's really you? Just because you write down a frequency of brain waves? And, and I would definitely fall on the camp of if you were to somehow upload your mind, you would be uploading a simulation, not the real thing. 
Well, you have to have continuous identity. So, and that that problem afflicts the soul sleep Seventh Day Adventist Jehovah's Witness doctrine as well. If you believe that we are nothing but a physical body, and then that physical body is going to be destroyed, then even if God Himself resurrects a new physical body that looks like our old one, since there was nothing in common between the old and the new, it's really not the same person anymore. Yeah, it's a new person that just looks like that original person. Well, so that's a big problem. We have to have something that stays the same throughout the whole process. The only way you get that is with the soul. Well, let me ask you something. You know, their their quest for eternal life. I mean, that's yeah. really what they want. Yeah, they 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 don't want to die. They want to yeah. extend. But you know, Elon Musk says people must die because otherwise we become stuck. You know, not that, but I'm sure he's on a quest also for his he wants to he doesn't want everybody to live he just wants to live okay (laughs) but here's what it says in ecclesiastes 311 he has made everything beautiful in its time and he has put eternity in into man's heart yeah yet so that he cannot find out what god has done from the beginning to the end well i think it's interesting that these people are evolutionists and they think that death is a natural thing that it's the the natural state of things but they then have to turn around and claim that they want to defeat death and they want to overcome death. Yeah. But evolution teaches that we should embrace death. Death yeah. is the natural order. You know, and if but, we, but if there you, is something in our hearts that says, no, that's not there's natural. More. There's more there's and more. I want more. There's more. That, I don't want death. And they're fighting against it. And if they want to defeat death so bad, then it would seem to me, why don't you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because he has defeated death. Well, I would agree there. That's what I, they I should mean, do. I mean, that's just that simple. You don't deceived. have to take 100 vitamins a day, and you don't have to, <laughs> like Ted Williams do, did, uh, have your head cut off and fr- frozen in the, in a lab out in Arizona or somewhere. Who's Ted Williams? It's a splendid splinter. I don't know what that is. Uh, last man hit over 400 major leagues. Oh, Okay, he was a pro, uh, he was a pro a baseball, baseball player. player. Yeah, baseball and player. And he had his head. Cut yeah, off. he had his head cut off. And was he already dead when they did it? Hopefully, uh, um, he was afterwards. No, yeah. I mean before. Yes, he was dead. He had passed away, and they were they froze him. I thought he was doing something like from the Last Samurai. Uh, have you seen the Last Samurai? I have seen the Last Samurai. I know there was, it a, lot was of, a, good a lot death. of chopping. Oh, okay. It was, it a, was good, a good death. Okay, that's when he I was, was honored to cut off his head. That's when Tom Cruise killed that guy's brother. Oh, no, killed that husband. Or that well, one. so, yeah. So, first of all, Tom Cruise did kill that woman's husband, and then he turned around and married her, I guess. I reckon that was, was that a socially acceptable thing to I do? I guess so. And then then also, but there was another part where the where the samurais defeat the, the forces of the emperor under the, I forget the guy's name, but... Yeah. He, and then the leader of that force that was defeated, he commits the Harry Carey? The, the seppuku at where he kills himself okay. with, or they also call it harakiri, which is where you cut your stomach. Yeah. He does that, but then he has the coup de grace, like be, uh, what's his name? Ken Watanabe. He, he cuts the guy's head off after he's done it as a mercy kill, like yeah. coup de grace, so he doesn't have to suffer. Okay. And then he says, I was honored to cut off his head. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good death. It was a good death. Well, <laughs> I think what we see nowadays, especially with the... But if he had had some ice on hand ice. at the time, or just take it up to a mountain and throw I, it in the snow. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, that's cryonics or whatever it is, cryogenetics. I don't know what you call it. Any cryonics. Uh, there are people that won't, they're getting parts of their... Body. I mean, it's cheaper to get your head frozen than your whole body. So you could get the head frozen in the hopes that, you know, they can, like, make some. You know, some animals can survive being frozen, including yeah. small mice. But they've done study, they have, they have attempted it for humans and it doesn't work. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. But no, uh, the, there, there was a guy, and I think it was actually the guy who invented the microwave oven. He was actually using it to. Uh, reanimate frozen mice wow and it worked he, he had, was able to do he it. had too much time on his hands so with small animals you actually can achieve it you can cryogenically freeze them and for how long them. i guess i don't know maybe indefinitely i'm not sure no i didn't i did have a friend one time probably not indefinitely when i was you when get I, freezer burn after a while right yeah i knew <laughs> I, I knew that 
I knew, uh, yeah, they put you in one of those. Especially uh, if you use a zip zip lock. lock. That is in the the right kind of zip lock. I I had a friend that was a taxidermist in Mississippi, and somebody had killed a snake. Uh, It was uh, either a rattlesnake or copperhead, and they wanted it mounted. Mm -hmm. And I remember him saying that um, he had it out on his counter, took it out of the freezer, had it out on his counter. I know that they hibernate. I understand that reptiles hibernate, but this. Uh, but he and, froze and the it. snake was supposedly dead, I reckon, because they'd hit it on his head and all that stuff. But uh, his wife was in there, and she said, Jody, that, that tongue just came out of that that snake's head. So, wait. Snake, they, the snake was not dead. It, had high, it, had, it was injured, but had been frozen in the freezer, and it was coming back. So he thawed the snake, and it came back to life. Yes. And he was, he was, he was going to stuff it. But it was still alive. It was still alive. It was crazy. Wow. But, I mean, it didn't live long. He killed it. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, <laughs> well, that's don't, don't freeze snakes see. in your freezer. Weird. Yeah, it was kind of strange. But um, I think what we have is that, you know, we're talking about the millennial reign of Christ. Well, well talking- these guys, they want to have their cake and eat it, too. They want to get rid of spirituality, get rid of religion, get rid of the Bible, and yet they want to keep all the good stuff that we they get from They want eternal that. life. They want eternal life anyway. They want eternal life. But it's not going to work out for them. I can it's guarantee just not going to that. Work out. I can guarantee it. And But God has put eternity in their hearts. They have a desire for eternity. But you know what? I can, I can even make an argument against eternal life that doesn't depend on their methods. So let's say that everything they attempt to do about like making machines out of their bodies and and transhumanism and cyborgs or whatever they attempt to do right let's say that it's a hundred percent successful yeah even then it's not going to be eternal life because they're still going to live in this physical universe where things can go wrong where things can accidents can happen wars can happen and if you think about you can still die so think about like what is uh, dying has a probability right like, I have a probability that is not zero of being hit by an airplane that's crashing out of the out of the sky right now, right? It's yeah. a low probability, but it's not a zero probability. Okay. And I have a probability every time I get in a car, there's a there's a low probability that I could be in an accident. Mm-hmm. Every time you do anything, yeah. walk out of your house, right. there's a low probability that you could get hit by an asteroid that's right. falling. Well... Multiply that low probability by infinity, yeah. and you know what you get? You get a probability of 1, okay. which is 100%. So my, the point I'm making is, no matter what they try to do to extend their life, right. there's still going to be a probability of 1 over infinity of time that something is going to happen that will kill them. Yeah, even if you reach the singularity. E- yeah, even if everything they hope for comes true. The merging See, of man and machine. Let me ask you something. If you did, could you imagine you like being at a wedding and on the dance floor, everybody doing the robot? <laughs> uh, you, would, you wouldn't have any choice at that and point. Everybody, everybody would do the robot. Yeah, right? yeah. So a lot of interesting stuff coming out of this. And, and I think it's interesting to see that, that what these uh, tech billionaires are doing, mm-hmm. uh, whether they intend it or not, what they're ultimately doing is building the kind of world that is going to fulfill end times prophecy. Yes, and they, they are, uh, I don't want to say dupes, but yeah. but they unwittingly... Like Elon Musk with his neural link, for example. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it, he has good motives, I think. Like he wants to help people who are paralyzed mm-hmm. to be able to move mm-hmm. robot prosthetics. But, and in and of itself, but that seems that's like a just good goal. One percent of what they're. Running. I know, but but think about the goal. Like yeah. in and of itself, that yeah. seems like a good thing. Changes, yeah. Like if somebody's sure. paralyzed, uh, they, wouldn't you love yes. to be able to give them yes. the ability to move their limbs yeah. again yes. using this brain implant? Yes. But where is it going to go? What is it going to ultimately be used for? Yeah. The Bible tells us. Yeah. The Bible tells us ultimately what it's going to be used for. But that it, you know, just like with anything that's bad you know the people that are developing it ultimately they're they're saying that they have good motives and they they have maybe good motives to begin with right so you know well you know um eternal life is found in uh jesus and um 
if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, we really emphasize that in our last uh, podcast. Uh, you need the, He is the way to eternal life. Um, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have eternal life. I mean, it, yeah. You, you will not have eternal life in a place called heaven. I mean, you're going to have eternal life. And, and what does life mean here? It's not talking about existence. It's talking about being in the presence of God. That's true life. Right. God is the is the giver of life. Right. So when we talk about eternal life, we're not talking about where, we're not talking about whether you exist or not. We're talking about whether you're going to be in God's presence or not. And if you're not in God's presence, that's death. Yeah. Separation from Separation. God is death. So eternal death is going to be eternally separated from, from God, God in the lake of fire. The lake of fire. And we, we covered that yeah. last week. So it's not as if we're teaching annihilationism uh, here. Everyone is going to be in existence for somewhere. eternity somewhere. You just want to be in the right place. You, you want to be in the right place. Yes. And that's eternal life. Yes. And, and um, <clears throat> we want to encourage you to see that out. You have a desire for eternal life. God's put that within you. It's found in Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the author of life. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He's the giver of eternal life. And if you've never uh, embraced the gospel, uh, contact us. We'd love to share with you uh, how to receive Christ by you know, repenting of your sins, placing your faith on, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's called the gospel to good news. He pays for your sin on the cross instead of you paying your, for your sin for all of eternity. Uh, it, it's good news. Well, Paul, with that, we're going to end our uh, our broad, uh, broadcast, and uh, we want to thank everybody for being with us, and we hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next time on the Uncensored Pilgrims. And we need to let you know that the views that we express on this podcast belong to Marty McLean and Paul Price. They are our views. They do not reflect the views of anyone else. And with that said, we hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next time on the podcast.